Jobs and taxes, roads and bridges, schools and test results, guns, drugs and health benefits. Governor Mike Pence touched on a long list of topics during Tuesday's State of the State Address, but most of the analysis that followed started and ended with the governor's take on balancing the rights of the LGBT community with the rights of organizations and small businesses that object to same-sex relationships on religious grounds. Joining me to react to that reaction and to talk about the rest of the governor's speech are Brandon Smith, State House Bureau Chief for Indiana Public Broadcasting, John Kroll, Director of Franklin College's Pulliam School of Journalism and host of WFYI Public Radio's No Limits, John Ketzenberger, President of the Indiana Fiscal Policy Institute and my longtime colleague on WFYI's Indiana Week in Review, and veteran State House reporter Chelsea Schneider, who currently covers education and public policy for the Indianapolis Star. I thank you all for being here, especially since you did so on short notice. Mm -hmm. Initially, the governor was scheduled to, uh, to be here to talk about the State of the State address. Uh, his office called and, and canceled. Let's, let's start with that, though. John Kroll, should I be paranoid? He canceled this. <laughs> he has canceled several other interviews uh, in recent days. Is, is there anything to conclude here? Well, I wouldn't take it personally, John. <laughs> I'm not sure you, you loom that large in the governor's universe. I but, think you're right about that. But, but uh, there is something, you know, even in the scheduling of the State of the State, the fact that it was on the same night as the State of the Union, pretty well guaranteed that at least some of what he was going to say was going to get drowned out by a larger microphone or megaphone, whichever metaphor you want to use. Um, and I think there was a certain element of calculation in that. I think he knew where he was going to land on the issue that people cared the most about in that speech was something that a lot of people were not going to like. And, and it was at the end of the speech. And it was at the end of the speech, uh, of the speech almost speech. as an afterthought. And even in the delivery when you saw it, I mean, he did not look like a comfortable man. And this is a guy who's been given speeches for, what, pretty much since he came out of the womb. Um, so you've got to figure that, that there was some plan at work there. Well, I won't take it personally then. I, I, I'll <laughs> come should, in off the should. ledge on, on, on that. <laughs> Brandon, uh, you, uh, you tweeted something last night, if I might bring it up, that I thought was interesting. You said you would have been more concerned about the governor speaking to one particular media outlet over others if he ever gave any specifics about what he thinks. I, Pretty I, interesting I, comment. Uh, well, is that, I, uh, and again, a part of this notion that uh, the frustrations that many have, uh, critics, admittedly, have, have voiced about uh, where he, what he said and what he didn't say? Well, and I, I don't speech? think it's limited to, to the state of the state this past Tuesday. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's something we've seen from Governor Pence all the way from, in my experience with him, from when he was running for governor in 2012 through now. He, uh, his style is to, with the exception of the 10% income tax cut that he ran on, he has avoided, for the most part, being specific about whatever he was advocating or opposing, uh, leaving it to lawmakers to figure out the details of a lot of his plans. Uh, in part, I think, because he got so much um, resistance to the 10% tax cut in his first year. But it, it is frustrating as both a reporter and as a member of Indiana's public to see the governor you know, go on a radio show the, ne the morning after the State of the State be asked specific questions and give no different answer than what you heard in the speech. It, it's, it's the same line, the same canned sort of uh, soundbite over and over and over and over again. And as someone who has to watch it over and over and over and over again, it gets frustrating. I guess he has talked about setting guardrails or parameters and then letting lawmakers uh, do their work. But I remember last year, to your point, with uh, the possible addition of live casino dealers uh, or land-based casinos, and he talked about no ex expansion of gambling, but stopped short of defining what well, was meant by expansion of gambling. But the problem was there that apparently he was telling lawmakers behind closed doors what he meant by no expansion of gambling, but refused to say that to I I in the public eye. So it's a question of, is he beholden to Hoosiers to tell them what he actually thinks, or does that all have to happen where they can't hear or see it. Chelsea, weigh in, what do you think? I think a lot of times, you know, Governor Pence decides to speak broadly on an issue because then he shifts the political risk of any decision making to lawmakers. 
And I think with that, if he gives more of a broad message about what he wants, then he can easily claim victory at the end. You know, so at the beginning of the session, if he's like, this is specifically what I want on this issue, but if they don't do it, I mean, he ends up looking weak, you know? So I think a lot of times he chooses to go more broad so he can say that most of his legislative agenda and most legislative priorities got through. Well, and, and Brandon mentioned the 10% uh, tax cut he ran on. He's, he ended up getting 5% and proclaimed victory. So I guess there's some logic to that. John, you're grinning over there. I, uh... <laughs> well, I think, all of, I think everything that has been expressed here is exactly right. But I think it's important to remember one thing is different this time, and that we are entering an election cycle. And it is all about controlling the message. And if he doesn't do those uh, random interviews with Brandon or Chelsea, uh, don't appear on John's show, don't come here, then he doesn't risk saying something that, like Chelsea said, will come back to haunt him. This way he's controlling the entire message. He's already in full campaign mode. Um, you will probably start to see advertisements before the end of the session. Uh, and if he had come out strongly on any of the issues that he talked about, and very perfunctory issues, I might say, you could go right down the list and say education, transportation, and we finally get to the RIFRA issue. Uh, they were very uh, vanilla descriptions. And the reason is, exactly as Chelsea said, but also because we are in the height of the campaign season, and he will be able to message as he sees fit uh, and control that message from his perspective. And I think that's exactly what's going on. And he's got a, a peculiar political challenge this year, because I don't think, you know, I've been covering Indiana politics for more years than I care to remember, uh, but I don't think I've ever you know, seen... We worked together I know, years, I know, 30 years I know, ago, I know, so I, know, I guess yeah. we can start there with the calculation, but... Uh, your producers are kinder than mine are. They, I generally get yelled at when I refer to my age <laughs> on the air, but uh, so his challenge, I think, though, is I don't think I've ever seen a governor who has been as polarizing as this one is. I mean, in some ways, what he has got to do is change the discussion, and I'm not sure he's figured out how to do that yet, because right now, I mean, with all due respect to whomever the libertarians choose and Democrat John Gregg, uh, this election's shaping up to be a referendum on Mike Pence, up That's or exactly down. Right. And, well, I mean, and I guess in his defense, he, he's in a bit of a box on this issue because everybody was looking to him to, uh, given the controversy last year and his advocacy of RIFRA initially, um, if he hadn't said anything, then he probably would have been criticized uh, for that as well. Yeah, but uh, to John's point um, that how do you change the conversation, how do you change the discussion, what is what is he going to propose? I mean, his billion dollar roads plan was, he was the first out of the box with a roads plan. It, it was thorough, it was detailed, it was, an, it was a, a case of him actually giving a lot of specifics, but lawmakers aren't sold on all of it. First of all, half of it won't take place until future budgets, if he's even governor then. And this year, about half of that money in, in bonding isn't exactly a slam dunk in the legislature because they don't love the idea of bonding for transportation projects. So that's a, a big idea, but I'm not sure it's enough to change the conversation because everybody's talking about that anyway. Past that, what is it? A few drug issues, mm -hmm. some education stuff that everybody agrees on. Right. He, 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 he can talk about HIP 2.0 a lot, and I'm sure he will, but that doesn't exactly endear him to his base, which just sees it as an expansion through Obamacare. So I'm not sure how he changes the discussion because he doesn't seem to have that one big idea that will capture everybody's attention just for Mike Pence. And maybe this is a return to the days when uh, short sessions initially were instituted, when it was supposed to be emergency legislation only and not be another opportunity to uh, start with a long agenda. But I'm not sure that's a cop out that he would want to take. We've certainly changed and evolved uh, in terms of our legislative process since that's, that was instituted. Well, let's look at what he did. And I do want to talk more about roads and transportation because of the funding of that being in great dispute. But in terms of, uh, before we get off the topic sure. of the civil rights issue, let's look at what he did say uh, during the speech. And, and I guess if the question, and I'll be somewhat flippant here, were, you know, do we extend full civil rights protections to the LGBT community, or do we double down in safeguarding the rights of, of those with firmly held religious beliefs? And the governor said yes. 
it, was, it was hard for some people, or a lot of people, I guess, to determine exactly what he meant, uh, even if you read the words. What, what do you think the takeaway was? Well, I definitely think he focused more on giving protections to religious liberties. I think in part because he lost some of his conservative base you know, last year when he passed the clarification to the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So I think Governor Pence sent a message that, you know, I'm not going to consider a proposal that doesn't give extreme, you know, protections, you know, to religious objectors, you know, but for example, you know, Senator Long, who has two proposals, you know, in his caucus, you know, going through, he believes that the way that they are written, you know, to extend civil rights protections, but also give religious exemptions, he thinks that they would fall under territory that Governor Pence would consider. Because even in GOP leadership, you had a difference of opinion. You heard some people saying, mm -hmm. well, there was an implied veto threat, maybe not even a very thinly veiled veto threat. And then others saying, he said he'd consider everything and, you know, it's all going to be on the table. So it's... I just, I think the messaging that you're getting from them, you know, when you speak to leadership is, you know, he opened the door. I mean, that's how they're at least seeing it publicly, that, you know, they think that he will consider, you know, what they give him just as long as it really sides with, you know, religious liberties, you know, over arguably, you know, LGBT rights. And he did say, I mm -hmm. will not sign a bill. Right but that doesn't mean he'll veto a bill. And of course, that's also what he does with every piece of legislation that comes to his desk, is give it consideration and to decide mm -hmm. whether it's constitutional and then sign it or not. Uh, I think that uh, what we saw in the state of the state was somebody who was between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. Uh, he is yeah. really stuck because uh, for the, you know, the vast majority of the state, uh, at least its major interests, the business community, a majority of people in the state by polling uh, are in favor of protecting the rights of LGBT people. Um, and there are many other protected classes already in the law. Uh, the other people look at this uh, as, a, as a potential infringement. Uh, the people who are his conservative base are looking to him to do better, they think, than he did last year because they were very disappointed. Uh, so he is really in a box, and he's, he's on an election year. Uh, and what we were looking for, I think, and I think what most people were looking for, because of the nine-month buildup from when he said, I'll make my decision after I've weighed this carefully, to the speech, we were looking for a definitive position, and it didn't occur. There is no definitive position in that speech on this issue or actually the other ones that we talked about. So there's some disappointment, I think, because he hasn't shown leadership on this. It's understandable that he wants to wait and see what the legislature delivers to him, uh, but I think that he's really in a no-win situation because if something passes that is perceived as protecting LGBT rights uh, at the expense of religious freedoms uh, or the other way around, he's going to have to deal with the backlash from that. And I think the other point here, and this picks up on, on John's argument, is he really has no cards to play here at all. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. constitutionally, Indiana's governor, not just Mike Pence, has one of the weakest vetoes in the country. A simple majority overrides it. So it's not really a veto so much as a polite request that you, th <laughs> the legislators <laughs> think again, you know, before they do this. And he was left in this difficult position of saying to the folks who are his base, those social conservatives who have supported him from the beginning of his political career, no, I'm not going to stand with you. He wasn't likely to please the folks who were upset about Riffer in the first place, so his choice was, okay, I'm going to make my really, really good friends angry and in order to try to please some people who aren't likely ever to vote for me anyway. So, and then, you know, the other piece I think we need to get is that the constitutional argument that he, he sort of advanced in the speech was more than a little shaky. I mean, you're allowed to think whatever you, you want in regard to your religious beliefs, but you know, if you have a religion that calls for child sacrifice or something like that, that's not constitutionally protected. We outlaw all sorts of activities. Right. That, well, yeah. well, how does this play out? Clearly, we know one thing uh, for sure. This issue isn't going anywhere, yeah. uh, even if he would just as soon be done uh, talking about it. You have Indiana Competes, a consortium of business groups, uh, tech groups saying we want full civil rights protection, Freedom Indiana, ditto, but then you have equally vocal, equally strident groups on the other side. Am I right, the governor, if he has his way, will not say another word about this, and if he 
he might let his veto pen, if in fact it gets to that point, do the talking for him. But the issue doesn't go away itself. No, the issue doesn't go away. I think he's hoping that he doesn't ever have to put a pen to paper either way. Uh, I think he's really banking on the legislature not being able to agree on, on a, a piece of legislation they can pass. Uh, and that's what he's hoping for. But I don't know if that that's any better for him because it's going to come up during the summer. It's going to come up in the fall for, for sure. And, and it's the question of does he have to want, I mean, it goes back to a point I made earlier. What do Hoosiers want out of their governor? Do they want a leader who says, this is what I think, this is what I want? That's what Mitch Daniels did, and I think people liked him. Um, it's not been Mike Pence's style, but it's a question of whether or not Hoosiers are satisfied with that. Back to the roads and transportation, since that is where the, the money is, if we want to follow the money and where uh, people potentially could be hit in their wallets, if they're not already being hit in their wallets mm. by bouncing around on the, on the uh, pothole-filled roads. The governor, everybody agrees that something, there's money, there will be asphalt put down uh, to a greater degree next year than there is now, but then that's where the agreement really stops. The governor alluded in his speech to looking at people's pockets or wallets as the last place you'd want to look, meaning he's not keen on a tax increase, which the Republican House plan uh, is is entertaining. Yeah, I really would have liked to have seen a close up of Brian Bosma's face. When <laughs> have the, uh, the heart <laughs> monitors and the whole thing. Where, how yeah. does that play? Because you do have this rift uh, now, not between the traditional R and D chasm, but it's actually now between the House Republican Caucus and the governor's office. Well, to a and you've extent. got the the whole dynamic of. Uh, the legislature in general, which was restive under Mitch Daniels, they thought a lot of what happened there they didn't get enough credit for, and they also sort of at times felt like they were children being summoned to the, the principal's office <laughs> on a regular basis and were frustrated about that, made it clear when, when Governor Pence came in that that dynamic needed to change. Um, I think the other thing that's going on is that a lot, like Brian Bosma, in addition to the public policy component, sees a future for himself that is beyond the Pence governorship. And to some degree, there are a lot of studies now that, that show that millennials, you know, who are emerging as a much more important voting block, just see a lot of public investment issues differently than their predecessors. That don't raise taxes argument isn't as persuasive to them. They see it more as a question of public investment and what the return on that investment is going to be. And I think at least part of Bosma's plan was a recognition of that fact, that you do have to pay for what you're going to get. And, and, and the, tax, mm. the tax hike they're proposing amounts to about $25 a year for mm. the average Hoosier driver. Mm. This if would be you, the, if the you, gas the, the tax, gas tax you also the, yeah. have yeah. The, the dollar per pack. Right, you have cigarette. the dollar per pack cigarette tax, which is a little it, even easier because there are, while there are still a lot of Hoosiers who smoke, a lot more of them don't. And so don't even see that sort of uh, in their pocketbooks. So that's going to be a hard, I don't, but I don't think the fight is between the governor and, and Brian Bosma. I think the fight's between Brian Bosma and David Long. That's mm -hmm. where their battle is. Whatever, well, I think whatever. Really whatever that's whatever, also where the power is, right. too. Whatever, <laughs> State whatever, government. whatever Rhodes plan the legislature passes, I'm almost certain the governor will sign. And he, I'm not sure how much yeah. of an impact he'll have well, on that. Well, time yeah. is flying by, and we can't have a discussion of taxes without talking to John Ketzenberger of the Indiana <laughs> Fiscal <laughs> Policy Institute, which just put out two reports on, on local tax uh, issues and the burdens uh, and challenges facing local governments. We get more roads, more road construction, but how do you think it's going to be funded by the time the gavel falls on the 14th of I March? I think that the House response, the House proposal uh, mm -hmm. from the Republican caucus is what we're going to see next year. I think this year you're going to see a combination of Senator Hirschman's local road funding plan, which returns local option income tax dollars to communities, lets them fix local roads and bridges, which are $3 billion in deficit, uh, so they need a lot of work. That'll help. I think you'll see that or some version. I think you'll see some version of the governor's plan uh, to uh, bring additional money into uh, the state roads. Uh, and I think you'll see it paid for ostensibly by uh, out of the surplus uh, funds and maybe shifting some other funds from other places. So I think you'll see a significant amount of investment in roads, both state and local. Uh, but I don't think you'll see any additional taxes, and I do think you'll see a call for study so that when next year's session comes along and they're rewriting the budget, you will see an attempt at a comprehensive plan that will raise taxes because you need that additional revenue. It's been 
almost 15 years since they've raised the gas tax in Indiana. We've had a lower uh, gas tax or a lower sales tax. Uh, there's a new regime that needs to be addressed, and I think you'll see that happen next year. And your point aligns with the fact that the two measures that you mentioned, the governor's proposal and Brant Hirschman's local funding proposal, both I think came out of committee with virtually no opposition, that's if, right. if, any, that's right. if any at all. Education, we've got to talk about it. We're almost out of time. But that's one area, surprisingly, where there, everybody seems to be in agreement in that. And it's pretty much uh, not what we're for as much as what we're against. And we're against ISTEP in its current form. And we're against using ISTEP scores to penalize schools or teachers. That's already on rails. Uh, I think it's the uh, legislation's already out of the original, uh, the House of Origin, is Definitely. that right? You know, I think the tipping point was back in the fall when they figured out how much ISTEP scores were going to drop for 2015. And you know, through that, they decided to, you know, suspend accountability or the negative effects, you know, of ISTEP, you know, for one year. And I just honestly think that, you know, it's Republican leadership wanting to make sure that they support teachers, you know, especially in, you know, an election year. Um, you know, a lot of their policies have, you know, angered, you know, the teaching field. So I think you're kind of seeing that at work. And we know that riled up teachers can produce results at the ballot box, right. as we saw with mm -hmm. uh, the superintendent's race uh, last time around. All right, we have to leave it there. We've scratched the surface, uh, a lot left to do, but uh, maybe we'll do this every week. Uh, we'll, we'll have you sign commitments on the way out of the studio. I appreciate it. And again, thanks for coming on short notice. Very much appreciated. My guests have been Brandon Smith of Indiana Public Broadcasting, John Kroll of Franklin College's Pulliam School of Journalism, John Ketzenberger of the Indiana Fiscal Policy Institute, and Chelsea Schneider of the Indianapolis Star.